latest single fact to emerge from today's world war, a struggle which has revolutionized so many old concepts of warfare, is the enormous effectiveness of air power, both in land fighting and sea fighting. Today, over all the oceans of the world, airmen of the United States Navy on patrol duty and in combat are playing a decisive part in the war at sea. And in calculations of the Navy's tacticians and strategists, the Air Force is ranked no longer as a mere auxiliary, but as a full partner with the surface fleet. Tell plane 11 to change his course and take a look at area Roger. We've got a new fix on that sub. Aye. build its great Air Force, the Navy can call and has called upon the best of America's young manhood. For naval aviation has behind it a proud tradition of courage and gallantry, of pioneering and adventure that has captured the imagination of the nation's air-minded youth. Within the short lifetime of most of these youngsters, it has grown from a groping experimental organization occupied with what most men dismissed as impractical dreams into a mighty force, which is today helping to reshape the destiny of the world. Preserved in the Navy files at Washington, on films and on paper, is the story of naval aviation and of the pioneers who paved the way for it. Men who shared a vision and who had the daring and courage and imagination to turn their vision into reality. These files, these pictures, constitute an eloquent record of the unbelievably crude beginnings out of which the science of aeronautics was developed. And man was launched upon one of his most audacious and long sought conquests, conquest of the air. Washington Smithsonian Institution, the government has gathered together to preserve for posterity more records and evidence of the faltering steps by which man advanced from his first tentative flights to mastery of the air. Here may still be seen some of the earliest planes, clumsy perilous contraptions of fabric and wood, propelled by weak and sputtering engines, which carried men like Wilbur and Orville Wright, Glenn Curtis, Ely and Ellison into the air. Here, too, are models of the first fragile and inadequate machines out of whose failures and uncertain successes was to come the knowledge that made the U.S. Naval Air Force possible. And with them are records of the great pioneers in naval aviation, men like Captain Washington Irving Chambers, who more than any other is the one who gave the Navy its wings. At his incentive, the Navy first began experimenting with aircraft and the development of the hydroplane or flying boat. It was due to Captain Chambers that the Navy was ready when the First World War came, with even the beginnings of an Air Force. And though in 1915 it had possessed but 17 planes, its hurriedly expanded seaplane squadrons made an important contribution to the Allied cause by their work in patrolling the French coasts and hunting submarines in the English Channel. During the war, the Navy's complement of men and planes grew from 38 pilots and 54 planes to over 2,000 planes and 3,000 pilots. As different types of planes were developed for different tasks, there emerged three main categories of naval combat aircraft. The large seaplane or flying boat with its longer range and lesser dependency on its operating base 
was to become the patrol craft. The seaplane was still an imperfect and unpredictable instrument when, under Commander J.H. Towers, today an admiral, the U.S. Navy flyers undertook in 1919 the first flight across the Atlantic. What no man had ever dared attempt before was accomplished by one of these planes, the NC-4, when after a fabulous flight across the sea to Portugal by way of the Azores, it arrived in Plymouth, England. Its crew, headed by Lieutenant Commander A.C. Reed, another pioneer who is an admiral today, was received in triumph by the Lord Mayor and thousands of cheering citizens. With the Atlantic conquered, Another and greater long-distance flight across the immense Pacific became the Navy's ambition. The historic flight to Hawaii under Commander John Rogers in 1925 established a record of 1,800 miles of continuous flying and blazed a trail to be traveled with scheduled regularity sooner than anyone would have then believed possible. Naval aviators were gaining new confidence. They knew what they and their planes could do. Flying was no longer a dangerous and uncertain undertaking. Its success dependent upon many unpredictable factors. <music> Meanwhile, U.S. naval officers had already begun experimenting with a new device designed to free naval planes from reliance on shore bases. The principles of catapulting, developed through endless experiments with full-scale models, were finally proven by courageous airmen who took their lives in their hands to demonstrate that the catapult really worked. Thus it became possible to add to the Naval Air Force short-range scout and observation planes to operate from and work with ships of the fleet enormously extending the fleet's effective range of action. From the catapult to the aircraft carrier, making possible the use of fast fighters and bombers in sea warfare was a logical step. With the first flights from an improvised deck on a battleship, the conviction grew among a few pioneer flyers that planes could successfully take off from and land on ships at sea. <laughs> 